Basically, the Times Archive comprises its back files, picture collection, which has about 50 million negatives in it. And um, then we, almost uniquely, but not quite, um, have all documents, or a lot of documents and artifacts relating to the paper's history. Um, I can't go to the archive and not ask you about Tutankhamun. Yes, I mean, Tutankhamun is one of the great um, stories associated with the Times. And the Times name has remained attached to it ever since. And explain what it was that the, ta- the Times' involvement. Carnarvon was very concerned once he learned from Carter that he had found a tomb that the world's media was going to just descend on Luxor and be all over the tomb, stop them being able to work properly, just get in the way. He decided that the Times was an excellent um, intermediary. The news would go to them. They would then exclusively syndicate um, the news and the pictures of the excavation story out to newspapers around the world. The Times then starts uh, the process of sending stories and photographs in. Stories turn up immediately because they're sent by telegraph. So we're publishing stories the day after or no more than two days after. Photographs take about two weeks to come back. So what did we do? Did we hang on to the scoop and wait for the pictures? We broke it immediately. No, we had to break everything immediately because newspapers were fed up with the fact the Times had got this scoop (laughs) and tried to break it, tried to Uh, undermine it. A fine journalistic tradition. Yes. So this is a note from uh, February 1923. And who's this from? This is from Harry Perry Robinson. The, the things that have just, the words that have just jumped out to me as a proper journalist. The expenses are the devil. Uh, the amount of money that goes in daily boat and donkey hire and postage, especially photographic plates, is horrid. What was the Times reporting in April 4th, 1933? So it was the very first flight over Mount Everest. Um, it actually happened on April the 3rd. But the Times had sponsored the expedition. It was the Houston Mount Everest expedition. And the Times, unusually for the time, a bit like the to- uh, King Tutankhamun expedition, it was a big photography exclusive. Yeah. What's this enormous contraption here? Okay, so this is one of two cameras that we ha- that existed for this expedition that the Times actually bought for the expedition. This one is one that survives in our archive. It's a Williams. Williamson P14 camera and what it is is exactly a very 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 heavy glass plate camera this is the spring-loaded mechanism where you would literally load your glass plate yeah and um, which is like a 5-4 typically sheet of glass you would then close it load it take your images expose the image expose the emulsion take it out very delicately load it back into your film box and take it back to the darkroom for developing, printing, eventually gets on the page in the paper. They had other cameras that were mounted on the plane. Yeah. Much more expensive cameras than these that in fact were getting severely affected by the weather and the dust and the particles just hitting the lens, ruining the images that they were getting on the first trial flight. They then chose to take this up in the plane. And if you look at that picture of the plane, it's an open top plane. There were oxygen masks, there were electricity units. And if you see on the side of this camera unit, there's a s- socket yeah. there. Yeah. That is the key to why this works, basically. There, there was an element that plugged in there yeah. that artificially heated this unit. And what's so amazing about this is that for millions of people, this is the first time they've ever seen, well, almost everyone on earth has never seen yeah. Everest. And I- I think that's the key about this thing. So we, we sometimes show visitors this. It doesn't look remarkable by today's standards, yeah. but you have to go back in time. This hadn't been seen before. Yeah. It, it was another first, a bit like Toon Car Moon. It was another worldwide first. The Times, unfortunately, was hit by a bomb in, on the night of September the 25th, 1940. Fortunately, it didn't actually wipe out the archives. It didn't even wipe out the edition that was being printed that night. The bomber um, hit in the early hours of the morning. Fortunately, the presses were housed in the basement of the building, which was a large concrete structure built to take the weight of the presses, not as a bomb shelter, but it served admirably as one for the staff. Do we think that the Times was the target, or was it just bombs are being dropped on London and the Times is in London? I doubt it was a target. Um, if for no other reason than um, apparently Goebbels read the Times every day. Oh. <laughs> so you mentioned the Times uh, continued to print, uh, continued to report the news, but it couldn't report the news the Times had been bombed? No, it, uh, it wasn't able to report at all. Um, wartime censorship precluded such things. So it was actually two and a half weeks before the Times was allowed to report. 
by which stage the Germans knew that the times had been hit uh, from other sources and were um, and were making gleeful um, uh, comments about how they'd knocked the times out, which of course they hadn't. And you've got here, well, one iconic food image of uh, Roger Bannister. Yeah, it's probably one of the most iconic moments in sporting history, really. On the track in Oxford, Roger Bannister breaking the sub four minute mile and becoming a worldwide superstar overnight. And it became the picture, the go-to picture. You'll see this print gets reused the time. We've already got that one, go and get that one again. Yeah. Go and get that one again. Because they think that's the picture. Oh, that's been used. Yeah. So that must be the best picture. Yeah. And what we found in 2014 was the seven original negatives. So there were more photographs taken that day. They just didn't make the paper. Yeah. And we scanned them in. We made a nice feature the following weekend for this Saturday sport. Um, it did really well. The, a reli reliving the day history was made. On the Monday morning, I had a call from the editor saying that Roger Bannister had been on the phone. And so this picture um, I can see now, that's Roger Bannister holding up one of those original glass negatives, which is on here. It's just a, yeah. one of those brilliant moments where the man who actually created the history, history, yeah. is looking at into his past. Um, and then my eye is drawn to the next thing, to see something in the archive. I was there when this happened. So this was in 2018, the height of Brexit shenanigans. What was going to happen with Theresa May? And um, Henry Zeffman, who listeners will know, is now Associate Political Editor of the Times, was asked to try and sketch all this out. And I think he started with like a notepad and he realised that wouldn't work. And ended up getting, it's a sort of, it's the cardboard from a stiff A3 envelope. And this is now in the archive. When you look at the finished thing, it looks like a piece of wonderful graphics yeah. work. What you don't see is the thought process behind it. What we have, as you say, is not one, but actually version version one and then 2.0 of his attempt to get the, um, the flow chart right. My eye is drawn to these photos over here because I can recognise that these are these are offices in the Houses of Parliament. What is so funny actually is that how little the offices have changed. They've still got the wood panelling, they've still got the mock gothic windows, the desks are slightly more modern. Yeah, you can really tell, you can tell the jump uh, to the 70s because there's a lot more beards. Yeah. Beards and quite wide ties. You need to come over and do some new ones of the, the grotty office in Parliament now. How does it compare? Uh, well, because the, the office in Parliament now is a sort of temporary Porter Gabin style building on the roof and it's full of old books and rubbish and the carpet is disgusting. Uh, so yeah, it would make a nice addition to your, um, yeah. to your collection. And in years to come, people will look back and say, blimey, in 2023, they lived in squalor. <laughs>